Hi everybody, this is Mrs. T for Mrs. T's Chem Talk for Regions Chemistry for Periodic Table. And in case you don't know who I am, my name is Beth Tuminello. I'm a chemistry teacher at Calhoun High School in Merrick, New York. In this video, we're going to review a lot about the reference, I'm sorry, the periodic table chapter in Regions Chemistry. So the first thing that you should note is that on the periodic table, elements are arranged by atomic number. Um, originally, scientists thought that they should be arranged by atomic mass, but that was wrong. So they're arranged by atomic number. That's this number down here. So you notice we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 118 over here. And the periodic law states that properties of elements are a periodic function of their atomic numbers. That means that we have certain trends that repeat over time when, they are, when the elements are arranged this way. So on the periodic table, we have this key, and it tells us that up on each, in each element's little box, we have the atomic mass on the top here. Remember, this is the weighted average mass of all of the naturally occurring isotopes. We have the symbol, the atomic number, electron configuration, selected oxidation states. We also see here that it tells us that relative atomic masses are based on the fact that They've based it on that carbon 12 is exactly 12 atomic mass units, and any of the numbers in parentheses are mass numbers of the most stable or common isotope. That would mean that those are radioactive, uh, radioactive elements. If we just go back for a second, um, I also want to point out down here, it says that anytime there is a star, 28 is at the beginning of the electron configuration. So starting at element 72, the 28 at the beginning of the electron configuration is actually omitted. So when we look at the way the periodic table is arranged, we should see that periods go across. So this is period one for hydrogen and helium. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon is period two. This is the start of period three, period four, and each of the periods is one of those horizontal rows. The period number also tells us the number of electron shells in those elements in that period. We also know that groups go down. Groups are the columns. So here from hydrogen down to francium is group one. Beryllium down to radium is group two. Scandium down to actinium is group three, and so on. Members of the same group usually have the same number of valence electrons, and that's what gives them similar chemical properties. That's also why we call them families, because of their similar chemical properties based on these same number of valence electrons. When we talk about metals, metals are to the left of the zigzag line on the table. The most active metal is going to be francium. Anything that gets closer and closer to francium becomes more metallic and a more active metal. They tend to have low ionization energies, which means that they tend to lose electrons in chemical reactions. They have low electronegativities, which means that they don't hold on to their electrons tightly. When they lose electrons, they form positive ions in ionic bonds. Positive ions in a sea of mobile electrons is a way that we can um, describe metals. They tend to conduct in any phase based on their mobile electrons and they're also malleable and ductile. Metals can be hammered into thin sheets and drawn into wires. Most of them are solids at STP. However, mercury, remember, is our liquid for the metals. Everybody else in the metal side is a solid at STP. For nonmetals, we are talking about elements to the right-hand side of the zigzag line, including hydrogen. Remember that hydrogen is a non-metal. It's not really in the right place for this on our table. The most active non-metal is fluorine. So as you get closer to fluorine on the periodic table, the elements become more non-metallic and more active non-metals. They tend to have high ionization energies and high electronegativities, which means that they tend to gain electrons in bonds. They're going to gain electrons to form negative ions for ionic bonding or share electrons to make molecules in covalent bonding. 
Non-metals, they lack luster, they're not shiny, and they are brittle. And because of the lack of mobile electrons, they are non-conductors or poor conductors. Most of them, uh, they're actually all over the place in terms of their phases. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and all of group 18 are gases. Bromine is a liquid. And all of the other nonmetals are solids. For metalloids, these are going to be the elements that touch the zigzag line in two places, but aluminum is a metal, aluminum is not a metalloid. These elements tend to have properties of both metals and nonmetals since there is that gradual change from most nonmetallic at fluorine to most metallic. At francium, there is a gradual change, and once we hit these metalloids, we're sort of in between metal and nonmetal. Noble gases are the elements in group 18. That would be helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and the new element OG, or the newly named element OG. They make monatomic molecules. They have stable outer valence shells, or also known as a stable octet of usually eight valence electrons, except for helium, who has two valence electrons that we call a stable duet. They have weak dispersion forces between their molecules, which means that they have weak intermolecular forces, but as you go down the group, their boiling points increase as their intermolecular forces increase. Helium is going to have the lowest boiling point in group 18 because it has the least number of electrons and the weakest intermolecular forces. Again, boiling points increase as you go down the group because intermolecular forces increase. For ions, ions don't have equal numbers of protons and electrons. Losing electrons makes for positive ions. Gaining electrons makes for negative ions. Allotropes are different forms of the same element. Different structures give them different physical and chemical properties. For example, the carbon allotropes are coal, diamond, graphite, and Buckminster fullerenes. Remember what we said in class that graphite is inside of a pencil, a diamond is an extremely expensive gem, and you would not um, accept a piece of pencil as your very expensive jewelry. They're very different from each other. The oxygen allotropes are oxygen, which is O2, and ozone, which is O3, and oxygen is what is required for cellular respiration. It's what we give people when they're having breathing difficulties. Ozone O3 actually causes people who have asthma and other diseases to have trouble breathing. So that means they're also very different. Different structure means different physical and chemical properties. Again, when we talk about a group, these elements in the same group have similar physical and chemical properties, and this is based on their number of valence electrons. So the same number of valence electrons dictates that they will react similarly in uh, chemical reactions. As we go down the group, the number of electron shells increases. I think you get the picture there. And since as we go down the group, the number of electron shells increases, that means that the shielding effect increases. That means that the nucleus cannot hold on to the valence electrons as tightly because all of these extra shells get in the way. This also means that as we go down the group, the atomic radius gets larger because the new shells go on the outside of what's already there. Ionization energy and electronegativity also are going to decrease down the group because the nucleus is what the protons in the nucleus need to attract the electrons from the valence shell in order to prevent them from being removed. They get more easily removed the harder it is for the nucleus to attract them, and electronegativity measures that attraction, so the attraction decreases as the nucleus has to pull through all of these um, extra shells. That's that shielding effect again. Alkali metals are going to be this group right here. 
Alkaline earth metals is group two. I'm sorry, let me go back for a second because the alkali metals do not include hydrogen. So alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, transition metals are all of the elements in groups three to 11, which includes these guys down here, the lanthanide series and the actinide series. The halogens are in group 17 and the noble gases, including helium, are in group 18 here. So we don't have names for all of the groups, um, but the groups, again, remember, are going to be in the same vertical column um, and they have certain properties based on where they're located. When we talk about periods, remember that periods are elements that go um, in the same horizontal row on the table. So for example, this is a snapshot of period four. Elements in the same period have the same number of shells of electrons, but they have different numbers of valence electrons as you go across that happen to be in the same principal energy level. As you go across a period, the number of protons increases, but the number of shells remains the same. So these guys all have four shells. And as we go across, on the left-hand side, we would expect the atoms to be the largest. And they're actually going to get smaller and smaller as we go across because of the number of protons increasing. Increasing the number of protons as we go across pulls those valence electrons in tighter. It's called an increasing nuclear charge. So the number of protons is positive number of protons in the nucleus. And as that increases, the strength of attraction for the nucleus um, and how, how strong it attracts the valence electrons increases, which allows the valence electrons to come in tighter to the nucleus. Atomic radius is going to decrease because of that. And since ionization energy and electronegativity are related to how strongly the nucleus can attract the electrons, they will both increase across a period. Remember that ionization energy talks about the number, I'm sorry, the amount of energy required to remove the most loosely bound electron. And electronegativity refers to how tightly those valence electrons are held. When we talk about ionic radius for metals, Metals are going to lose electrons to form ions, and since losing a negative electron forms something positive, ions of metals are positive. Ions of metals are also smaller than their atoms because by losing something, the atom has more shells and the metal ion has less shells and is positive. When we talk about nonmetals, on the other hand, nonmetals, because of their high ionization energy and high electronegativity, tend to gain electrons to form ions. These ions will be negative and they will be larger than their atoms because, again, a nonmetal atom gains electrons to make a negative nonmetal ion. The nonmetal ion has more electrons that cannot be held as tightly by the same number of protons in the nucleus, forming the valence shell to get further away from the nucleus. Remember that atoms and ions can be, po I'm sorry, ions can be positive or negative. When they're positive, they're smaller than the atom. When they're negative, they're larger than the atom. So this was the Mrs. T's Chem Talk review video for periodic table. If you're one of my students and you had any questions, please feel free to email me or stop into extra help. Uh, if, you're one of my, if you're not one of my students, you can certainly feel free to look around on my YouTube channel or find my website, which is um, tominellochemistry.weebly.com and look for some more helpful information. Happy studying.